Welcome to CodePub, your bi-weekly dose of technology, coding, war stories, and more importantly, people. Join us as we delve into the development world, exploring these people's stories, careers, and much more. Whether you're a seasoned developer or just starting, this podcast is your opportunity to learn, grow, and connect with the tech community. So grab your headphones and jump in. Hello, and welcome to the first video episode of CodePub. Today, we have a bit of a switch of gears. We have a 3D environmental artist frictional games on. Someone who's a doctor by trade, surprisingly enough. Someone who's an avid gamer, which influenced his decision to get into the career he's currently in. Alexander, welcome to CodePub. Thank you for having me. All right, let's dig right into it. First off, let's talk origins. How did you first get into game development? What made you, what was the drive that got you into, got you into this career path? Well, first of all, the drive is that I'm an avid gamer since I was a little kid. Since I got my first PC, I was basically only interested in that and nothing much else. Um, aside of that, uh, I always like to draw stuff and I was uh, impressed by uh, art scene in games. And um, yeah, basically, I think that's quite enough for pretty much anyone to to make them want to pursue that kind of a hobby or Mm -hmm. job even. Yeah. yeah. I would say that's a common story with a lot of people. They take an interest in games and then take they get into computing professionally in one capacity or another. My story is similar, sure, but it's rare to find somebody that, you know, really liked gaming and then followed fully the path of a, you know, game developer and stuff. Uh, what kind of games do you like to play in general? What's your favorite genre? What uh, are some titles that you like to play and enjoy? Well, mostly, mostly horror games, shooter games, something in between, um, adventure games, not that classical adventure style games, but more of an action adventure, let's Mm -hmm. say. Um, And uh, yeah, I, I don't spend out my interest a lot. I pick few genres that interest me the most and I'm there. Cool, cool. You know your tastes pretty much. Yes. Too, right? <laughs> <It's freaked about. laughs> cool. Okay, let's switch gears to your educational background because in many senses you don't really have a traditional background in terms of like how does one get into game development in general? You know, you're a doctor by trade. Yes, I am. How, what made you get started, you know, with the idea of being a doctor? Oh, that one. Uh, well, uh, my entire family are doctors, all of them. Mother, father, brother, uh, and the broader family. Even. Um, so, let's say that there wasn't a pressure about it, not openly. Yeah, but there kind of was like a hidden, sneaky suggestion <laughs> that that would be the the most fruitful career choice for me, which then might have seemed like a good opportunity, but that was that time was was um, the point where stuff started to change here at least in Macedonia, Um, those kinds of things that I'm working today and uh, for more of a decade since uh, that was not really a possibility back then and uh, people were looking for some good old-fashioned jobs Mm -hmm. that you just take and stick with it for the rest of your life. And uh, with that lack of options for me, I just followed that uh, intuition to just 
yeah, but my parents are all doctors. Maybe, you know, it will be a bit easier for me to land a job as one. And uh, yes, yeah, like that, that was the initial thinking. But, but then, as I said, stuff started change. And uh, a division happened in my career choice. <clears throat> but right at the end, not right at the end of my studies, I was already working as a doctor for about two years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, a uh, decision came about to make a choice. And it was a hard one, I can say. And I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I went for it all in. That's cool. That's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree that the industry has changed or the society in general changed quite a bit during the past, let's say, 12-ish years or so. People started thinking, at least that's my opinion, thinking more outside of the box than what we were raised to think the way that we were raised to think. So I'm happy to see like that you made such a career switch and you seem happier at any rate. Yes, I am. <laughs> Yeah, you actually did a bit of a stint with doctor work. You had yes, a bit of a professional stint with that. So what was your experience with yes, that? I, I worked for a couple of years in the psychiatry world. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting one. <laughs> yeah. um, the first year was much more fun, much more diverse in um, and uh, types of patients I encountered. The second year was a bit more boring, yeah, because I was only uh, visiting one ward, and it was the ward for alcoholics. Yeah, and that's not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I would say it's kind of better. I don't know. Not sure. Maybe better because those people are not, you know, sick people in the traditional sense of psychiatry, mm -hmm. but they're suffering from substance abuse. Right. And uh, yeah, there's not none of those interesting stories that you would uh, take away from uh, people with uh, schizophrenia or uh, other psychotic. Uh, diseases, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, it, it was interesting. But along the way, I didn't really find myself there. I felt like I was okay to spend my time with the patients, mm -hmm. to give the most from myself for them, but. On the other side, I wasn't really interested in what new meds have been released by companies, but rather what games are released by <laughs> companies. That's so, understandable. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, couldn't really see myself there for uh, a long time. It felt kind of depressing, you know, to walk the same path to mm -hmm. your work every day and imagine that that will be the same path that you will walk and uh, the same room you will be spending your time in, the, yeah, the same details in it, just getting older and dirtier, and it was kind of depressing to imagine that. And uh, so, yeah, it was <clears throat> in the nick of the time that I've ended up with uh, a couple of friends mm -hmm. who I've known for some years back. Uh, friends from uh, internet cafes where we played games. <clears throat> People that I've played d and with. Oh, Did nice. You know? Yeah, I happen <laughs> to know them too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, I was on the phone with uh, one of those guys and uh, he just called me like, uh, come on, visit us, like, see what are we doing mm -hmm. here, like we were making, making a game. 
and I was hyped as hell about that. And I just paid them a visit, not not much expectancy out of that. Mm -hmm. So I paid them a visit. I saw the game. It was kind of okay, not really uh, my cup of tea, but I played those kinds of games when I was a kid uh, on the arcades. Uh, but it was a game, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> how often do you see that being seriously developed by unserious people? True, and considering the time frame at, we at which it was built, yeah, doubly so, I would say, that pretty much nobody was seriously doing games back then. So, you know, any opportunity would have been, I imagine, very interesting to jump at. Yeah. And I kind of got the offer, like, uh, why don't you uh, draw our concepts, mm -hmm. like, for the spaceships and stuff. It was a shoot -em up game, like, uh, your classic type of uh, shoot -em up top-down <coughs> game. And... Um, I said, yeah, like, then let's do it. I mean, uh, what bad can come yeah. out of it? And uh, so I paid them another visit and another one, and I started hanging out daily, pretty much there. And um, we were uh, spending time in, in this friend's apartment. Mm -hmm. It was our office. And uh, basically, after that, I was going to the psychiatry ward, <clears throat> trying to spend as little time as I can, which uh, was lucky for me because that was the second year of my uh, experience as a doctor, uh, because uh, my job was not really I would say almost non-existent. I was basically hanging out there. It wasn't the same as before, the year before. Right? So in medicine, it's just an admin job. Yeah, yeah, kind of like uh, my appearance was only uh, noted and nothing much else was left out for me to do mm -hmm. there. And uh, that was lucky in itself because previously I had to spend my hours on the psychiatry ward. And here I didn't really have to spend my hours there. So I was stealing myself away as early as I can and uh, going uh, to the apartment at my friend's place. <laughs> where we, Do the fun thing. <laughs> yeah, make the game. And yeah, I, I, I had a nose that it might be the thing that uh, would be more successful than that, what I was doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right, right. Yeah, before we get into you, you started talking about uh, Tesseract games and the game you made from that effort. I wanted to talk about something else for a bit before we get into that. Just to get into the more, well, dominant side of you, the way I see it, at least. Ever since I met you, you were one of those creative types that knew how to draw, that had, you know, pretty much the best artistic skills around. And I imagine that that artistic and creative side had a lot to do with your current career choice. And the uh, thing with uh, Tesseract was just serendipity, and it just happened at the right time, at the right place, exactly. pretty much, right? So... What about your creative side? Uh, did um, that thing dominate over everything else that you had in terms of education, in terms of, you know, your sort of career choice from before and education wise? Was that more important and more a stronger thing for you to make that choice? Yeah, well, that was uh, basically a, a skill that uh, I was uh, looking at being something that I would be continuously interested in, you know, to um, spend effort in. I was not that interested in uh, medical stuff, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yes, if you take away all the other options, yes, but not all that much. Not much to the extent that I would uh, pursue to enhance myself 
more and more. And uh, this was a thing that I wanted to pursue. And uh, I wanted since always, since mm -hmm. before I even got the idea to, to make the choice to you know, go at uh, the medical university. Um, but out of lack of options, I did yeah. that. So, yeah. It is uh, it is quite uh, an important thing the thing you mentioned you know drawing or being interested in art in general yeah it was decisive for yeah. that the raw creative drive I imagine yeah. yeah on the other side of that coin with your medical experience that you had did that in any way. Um, inform or inspire any sort of the current work you're doing with your day-to-day -day job? Did it have any sort of impact, that education? I'm not sure. I I wouldn't say so. Maybe... Uh, maybe you could easily say right off the bat anatomy, mm -hmm. but I'm not a character artist. I'm not all that much interested in uh, characters, especially people, human characters. Mm -hmm. uh, so it didn't really have all that impact. Maybe it had a lot of other impacts. I don't know. Maybe uh, discipline and uh, maybe having yourself contained in a place that you don't like for enough Mm -hmm. long time that you want to burst out of it and make something for yourself I know right. yes I if imagine that that didn't happen then this wouldn't have came at the right moment in time so yes <laughs> yeah I imagine that medical school wasn't a particularly enjoyable experience in that sense sometimes you had to do a lot of learning for prolonged periods of time and that sort of trained you to be persistent I imagine right yeah. Cool. So, okay, let's get into your first professional gig and, well, your first experience as a professional somebody that does something that has to do with games. I'm not even sure of the title you had in the first company. So, how, uh, how was your experience like with your first uh, game, the, the thing that you got published on Steam as a first, you know, professional... Well, professionally published game from Macedonia on Steam, actually. Yeah, so we're talking Testbrack. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Testbrack Interactive. Um, that was us, the people that then we got together, uh, the guys that called me over to do the concepts for them. Uh, so, yeah, we were around for, I think, about five or so years. Five or six years, but uh, don't take my word for it. I'm not sure how long of a period we were uh, officially registered as uh, Testwork Interactive. Mm -hmm. mm, but yeah, man, the experience was exhilarating. I mean, uh, hanging out with uh, the people that you hang out all the time away from work and people that you uh, go out with and having fun, getting drunk, all of that, you are making a game together <laughs> and uh, no restrictions, no nothing, no deadlines. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine there weren't a lot of money in that as well, but... <laughs> yeah, but it isn't on, on another side. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah, the, the experience was... Uh, the room. Um, so we, we were around for five or six years. We we started working on that more seriously. Uh, started to look for um, to look for investments, and we got a couple of investments. One smaller one at first, just to. Uh, kind of started away with. Uh, it was far from enough to like getting us properly paid. <clears throat> Not to mention the few unpaid years before that. Yeah. 
that were worked just out of love. Labor of love, yeah. Yes. And um, so, yeah, uh, after some time, we, we got a more serious investment, one that we could use to get uh, properly paid, like for a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used that final year to finish up Extributor. That was our game. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it launched 2006, uh, May 26th on uh, Steam. Uh, we were partnered with Calypso Media mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah, they uh, they used to be pretty big, still are, to my knowledge. Uh, I'm not sure. Honestly, I'm not sure. I, I haven't followed up on them uh, mm -hmm. recently. Yeah, and they all also have all these uh, divisions on the side. We were under the Casido Games division. Mm -hmm. That's a thing that's under Calypso Media. So yeah, uh, we had a publisher, and uh, with them we basically released. The first game um, in Macedonia on Steam with a publisher. There were a few smaller games released before that, completely independent. Uh, yeah, but we were like the, the first team with uh, a publisher and all that jazz. So, yeah. Uh, something more from my experience on that side. Uh, the key point uh, in Tesseract for me was the transition from a concept artist to a 3D artist. All right. So, because at first I, I drew concepts on paper, imagine that. <laughs> uh, no, but that's cool. That's detailed, cool. Detailed, precise concepts <laughs> on paper uh, with a pencil uh, that you can undo with an eraser. After that, and <laughs> <laughs> not very high tech, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so slowly, I kind of got into Photoshop and to using a, a tablet and did the concepts there. It wasn't much of a concept art, not by far similar to anything mm -hmm. that people would imagine today basically it was outlines of black and white uh, just shapes and tones sometimes of assets to be modeled in 3d and uh, there was a pretty distinct uh, misunderstanding it's it's basically like two languages mm -hmm. that need to communicate with each other uh, uh, between the concept art and the 3D work. You, you can do the concept in 2D, it's on paper or on the screen, it doesn't matter. It's a 2D image and uh, unless you draw the image from all sides, uh, all perspectives, uh, the 3D artist has no idea how that other side looks or how actually long is this because sometimes they're just drawn in a perspective. Yeah, it doesn't always translate well. No, it, it doesn't at all. And <laughs> you get some crazy shapes that the other guy understood like he did on his end uh, that possible to be understood from the concept image and you have to be here to guide that process mm -hmm. further to uh, repair all that mistakes but now in 3D and um, because of that uh, time sync of you know translating a concept in 3D not just doing the concept and making it in 3D but like uh, doing, repairing all the mistakes that came out out of that transition. Uh, I little by little started understanding 3D and, you know, just asking about it and trying to make some of the fixes myself, mm -hmm. then all of the fixes myself, and then like properly making my first 3D model 
with a shit ton of errors in it. <laughs> and, uh, waiting for my friend to come over and repair all that. Uh, and yeah, that's how I got into 3D. <clears throat> Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I want to switch gears a bit to... It sounds awesome working with a group of friends, but at some point you became a company. Yeah. Did, uh, did that change stuff, the way you work, the way you had the freedom you had before? There were probably a lot of expectations from investors and so forth. It changed everything. Yeah, it really did. <clears throat> not, not with the work ethics, uh, only, mm -hmm. but it changed the game and changed the mm. game uh, really much. Uh, it was supposed to be um, a pretty different game before that. Cheers, man. Cheers, man. <laughs> and um, we had to change a lot of stuff, cut away a lot of stuff, and basically. Uh, instead of making a game that's going to be linear, mm -hmm. we ended up making a game that was more in line with the tower defense. Genre. Right. Just a second, we didn't uh, explain what the game was about before we get into the, the changes. It was about spaceships and uh, shooting other spaceships, exploring different planets in a linear style, level by level. Mm -hmm. uh, some objectives to be done inside the levels until you can progress to the next level, uh, combating bosses and uh, space missions. Right. And uh, yeah, basically there was a bunch of towers back then, but all that towers were against you and you had to shoot them and not build them. Right. And yeah, uh, that was it. That was the game about uh, basically we uh, the original thing that we were trying to pull off here was um, taking a step away from the your typical shoot 'em up top down uh, game uh, to a more of a three D reproduction of that type of a game where instead of the screen moving down by credits in a movie, mm -hmm. um, you could rotate that screen and go back and turn around. Ah, right, right, and right. So sort of that. like a scroller, mm -hmm. but in all directions with yeah, freedom with of freedom. movement. You, you, yeah. you could go back to the start of the level and go in any direction, uh, which wasn't all that original. There was a game called Nuclear Assault. Mm -hmm. It was with a helicopter and it was a shoot em up. It was oh, I remember that one, yeah. 3D, yeah, I think it, it, it got a sequel as well. And you could rotate all around and shoot the enemies and explore the levels. So we were not all that original in that sense, but uh, that's like the... Um, thing that, that that we wanted to take away from it. At first, it was the traditional shoot em up mm -hmm. game. Let's be clear about it. But after some time, after I joined, uh, then uh, we wanted to try out some, some other stuff and uh, kind of be able to shoot the aerial enemies and shoot the ground enemies as well by, you know, using the mouse. Mm -hmm and kind of pointing with a pointer laser on the screen and uh, getting the sense for the depth you can hit your target. So <clears throat> that was our you know, big idea at the time. Right. Well, it wasn't a horrible idea. I kind of enjoyed the game, honestly, the times I did play it. It was an interesting thing. It didn't really feel like like a whole thing completely finished, but... It was an interesting experience. Yeah, it, it was a rush thing. It was a rush thing. The the the, yeah, the idea with the, the tower defense came in the last year. That felt a bit awkward, but yes, because I mean, not in the last year, but right before the last year, because there was just a lot of things to be scripted mm -hmm. for that to work to have linear levels. With, 
exploration yeah. and triggering zones and stuff happening and depending upon each other. So, um, uh, and we had only one programmer. Uh, later, we employed a bit more to help us out, but still, uh, for that uh, big of a morsel, it was still not enough. And uh, put on top of that, that we were all inexperienced dudes. <laughs> it, it was the first professional gig for all of you, if I'm not mistaken, right? Uh, professional gig. game development gig. Ah, yes, yes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Game development, yes. Uh, professional, no. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, things got pretty scary that we won't be able to finish the game on time and uh, <clears throat> uh, decision came to kind of uh, chop out the pieces of the game into manageable you know, like uh, square levels uh, that you're in them and not much to do in them, mm -hmm. uh, but rather to defend your base against incoming waves of enemies and build towers and all yeah. that, which wasn't simple, let me tell you, but uh, I guess it was, you know, I'm, I'm not a programmer. Uh, the art was there. Uh, it could have been anything as far as the art part goes, yeah. but uh, from the programming or game uh, design point of view. Yeah, it wasn't uh, simple, but maybe simpler than making a linear game. I don't know, but uh, I'm, I'm happy that it finally came out in the end. It flopped, it really did, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it made all of us where we are today. Yeah, so Tesseract doesn't exist as a company anymore. Past that game, nothing really happened with no, the I'm, company? I'm not sure. I think it still does. Oh. I mean, none of us are in it anymore, but I think it still kind of exists on mm -hmm. paper, but I'm not sure it's possible that it, uh, it got closed uh, a couple of years ago. Right, right. Okay, that's, well, it's sort of a sad story, but it's an interesting learning experience, I imagine, oh, no, because... It's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the happiest story. Cool. Yeah, well, okay, from the aspect of a career switch and having something published that you can write yeah, your name on. I, I mean, that, that, that's, that's the thing. That's, that's the value in it. it. It's not for the money. We, we wanted to make a, make a game, and we made a game. And we even published it, and it exists. You could even... <laughs> buy it today. You can still buy it. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So yeah, for all our listeners, buy it people, it's that's awesome. Thing. <laughs> it's, it's sad because I can't buy it still because I don't have it. I had it, but I don't have it anymore because why? <laughs> I don't know. Because Calypso uh pulled the games, their games, their entire catalog out from our libraries. And I don't what, know what they are, why. <laughs> Even our own game that we made. So now today I have to buy. No, no, that that sounds exceptionally stupid. But <laughs> who am I to judge? <laughs> so anyway, lessons learned in general from like your first professional game development gig. What were what were the big things you would like to sort of outline that were interesting from the experience as a whole? Uh, you mean from Tesseract specifically? Yeah. yeah. Don't give up. Yeah, sweat and tears. Don't give up. Uh, I mean, if there is the smallest uh, possibility that you can go on with your life without giving up, don't give up. If that's the thing that you love, the thing that you want to do, then uh, invest yourself in it. And um, do not think uh, about the money, mm -hmm. about positions, you know, about your career, about all that past and future. Don't think about it. Uh, think about now. Make the game that you... Well, it doesn't need to be the game. Make the thing that you love to do. 
and make it out of love and make it good if it's done in that fashion with that sense uh it will bring about its success mm -hmm. no make no mistake about that it All right. will. if you invest yourself enough in it it will turn around for you Sounds like, well, you're describing passion and basically pouring passion down into something you... Yeah, and, and uh, people would argue that you cannot, you know, eat bread out of passion. You cannot eat uh, passion. Of course, you have to survive. That's why I said if you have it as an option, you know, if uh, you're not, you know, with your back against the wall and absolutely have to do something else to survive then of course don't be stupid don't do that right but um if you have the chance to do what you love and still survive then do what you love and after some time you will survive out of the thing that you love cool that, that sounds very wholesome surprising it's a good advice <laughs> so Let's switch gears to a bit to your teaching experience. You had a brief experience as a teacher. You taught people's, well, it's a 3D in general, right? 3D art. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, was yeah. that like? Yeah, that was, that happened sometime after Excubitor, the game we developed, flopped. And basically we all had to disband and go our separate ways and... Um, yeah, for a brief period, I was I got employed by by uh, other visual effects company. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not working on games, but still, it was the same um, uh, the same thing as far as really art goes. Uh, I was for a really short time in uh, FX three X. Oh yeah, I remember them. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I jumbled up things here. Uh, that did happen, but it happened before our final year of uh, pushing for the release of Extributor. We were kind of disbanded for some time after the first investment, and uh, because we were kind of in an, uh, into the unknown at the time, the future of Testwork and Extributor was unknown, but uh, we got uh, the other opportunity for investment and a chance to finish up the project. And that's where, when I um, left 3X and went on to, to push for the release of Excluder, which we did. And yeah, after that, uh, we were disbanded again. And uh, I found a job uh, the, at Cebus mm -hmm. Academy uh, of Multimedia and Design, and I uh, was teaching uh, 3D for the purpose of game development there for like a year mm -hmm. or so. And um, yeah, that was that was kind of strange at first. I, I, I never imagined, nor did I want to imagine myself Standing in front of <laughs> class, <laughs> it, it, it's a different experience yeah, for sure. <laughs> and talk to people that uh, all look at me, <laughs> have expectations, uh, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, more, it was uh, kind of a weird idea uh, for me, but yeah, I said like, why not? I accepted it and. Uh, it turned out to be quite fun, honestly. Uh, that weird thing of uh, you know people staring at you and you know, uh, not knowing what to say here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it gets uh, awkward, awkward sometimes. Yeah, uh, passed <laughs> for a class or so. Yeah, <laughs> like the next day. Uh, you are kind of familiar with all the people at the breaks. You hang out with them. Some of you are your age. You know, not some of them. Not all. Not all of them are kids. 
so yeah, it, it turned out quite fun. We uh, were working on uh, some projects, uh, like uh, little projects in different um, in different parts of of the the three D course. Uh, and in the end, they were doing like a final project that kind of brought together all the stuff they had learned uh, throughout the year. And uh, yeah. Do you see yourself as a teacher or would you do that no. again? No. <laughs> no. If I must, I would. Uh, if you ask me, do I want? No. Uh, I could say that, yes, I would, uh, I would find myself in a position to be a decent teacher. Mm -hmm. I know how to transfer my knowledge to other people to, uh, you know, make all that uh, technical gibberish kind of more uh, attractive or mm -hmm. kind of more understandable that's a to, big part of teaching to yeah. someone you know uh i think i'm i'm, I'm okay with that but I, I wouldn't look at that that uh you know a career and see myself yeah you're more of a, more of a maker than a teacher I yes say. yeah it just leave me be <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah cool then you had a stint at uh, this place called Napnog Games, which I still have a very hard time pronouncing. Which Napnog, had a bunch yeah. of K's and N's in weird yeah, places. They, they so changed the, the, the logo and the title. Yeah, you, what did you work on there? What was your job like? What were your day to day stuff? This is again a game development company that used to be a very big thing in Macedonia back then. I'm not sure whether it still is a big thing. They're really not up to date with what uh, they're doing. Uh, they are around. They're around. Yeah. Uh, they have this uh, another uh, kind of studio. Uh, they're kind of split up mm -hmm. into two studios. Uh, the new one is uh, called Indios, if I'm not mistaken. I'm really not sure mm -hmm. what was the name. It was strange the first couple of times <laughs> when I heard it. I couldn't remember it. Um, yeah, they're, they're still around, uh, I think they're focused on quality assurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quality of life, uh, games. Um, so yeah, uh, knock knock. That was a crazy experience. <laughs> give us the highlights. It was a long one, but give us the highlights. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I mean, it, it would take a long time <laughs> to uh, give away everything, but, um, you know, like, uh, take all the crazy people from, from this subculture in Skopje, specifically, not only from Skopje, but you know, Macedonia, mm -hmm. most from Skopje, people that undeniably and I know unavoidably know each other from uh, internet cafes and you know it's a small city and true and from just people hanging out playing games and just grabbing all of that bunch and cramming them into this <laughs> studio. <laughs> you know, Go that, make games. <laughs> yeah that was a recipe for disaster <laughs> in the most fun kind of sense. <laughs> kind of awesome. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, basically, uh, people are coming in for interviews and you know all of them personally. <laughs> 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 There's no strangers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was uh, not not games. I think, I don't even think I know that was the most uh, important uh, the important step for me to get into the sense of doing this professionally mm -hmm. like really right professionally in a serious company um, 
you know, working under leads, deadlines, and many, many other things that you didn't care about and didn't even want to care about. Before that, you know, um, yes, I picked up on a lot of skills before that, but if you believe me, you, you are entering the space and uh, you feel like a noob. You feel like you don't know anything. Mm. And uh, <laughs> it kind of uh, gets you into this panic mode, like, oh my God, what have I been doing <laughs> all of these years before? Like, I thought I knew something. No. <laughs> you, you were only like uh, beginning to new things and hanging around in your comfortable knowledge yeah yeah and yeah, yeah. now you had to learn a lot more stuff and that was kind of terrifying at first but yeah it didn't last much uh there was a lot of people around me that i could uh, learn from and uh very good working environment basically it was like a dream environment <laughs> it was uh because i was in a you know a, a big company before that uh but that was not really you know the same uh stuff were much more distant departments were much more distant between each other and uh, uh, there wasn't all that freedom and uh, all that family kind of Mm-hmm. And uh, here in 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 it, it, it was alright. It was a blast. Sounds awesome. Sounds awesome. Well, it sounds so detailed that we might have to do another episode just for that. But yeah, maybe some other time. <laughs> we don't have that much time left, to be honest. So I wanted to switch gears to something. Well, we had as a mutual experience. <laughs> We went to the same art school together and I'm not sure why did we go to the same art school together because he is actually a decent artist. He was a decent artist. He was always great at what he was doing. He didn't need to go to a school, but as he explained it at the time, he needed a place to go and paint pretty much. And I would say that he put the rest of us to shame. (laughs) I'm not even going to debate that at all. But there's this interesting aspect to your character that... You never seem happy with what you did or the result of what you worked on. You're not, well, you are a perfectionist. I'm not going to miss words. You you seem like a perfectionist and you know, the benchmark perfectionist pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And uh, yeah, the reason why I went there was to get to know the basics, you know, because mm-hmm. uh like most of the things you know in my life that I know and uh, tend to develop my skills in I I don't know anything about on uh, like in an academic sense uh, you know in the traditional beginner and step by step and so on kind of sense so uh, I needed something that will make me start from uh, the beginning because everything I did up until that point was just something that I did on my own. I had examples that I could follow. Right. Yeah. Uh, I had that things, but it, it's not the same. It's not the same when you just look at stuff and try to be okay on your end, and if you have a living person with you in the room, uh, you know, telling you, pointing out your mistakes, and uh, that was pretty uh, key in, um, in 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 my in that experience. So uh, yeah, yeah, we went together for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I think it's shut down now. I'm not sure that I don't, don't think it's there. working. No, no, I haven't been there yeah, for the, a couple the, of years the as well. Pandemic did its thing. Yeah, I, mean, I think for, for that atelier, 
Um, yeah, uh, but but that that thing was great. I mean, starting from the beginning and learn the things that you never pay attention to when you're starting a drawing mm -hmm. uh, was uh, extremely important. Um, <clears throat> and also, you know, like uh, getting to know other techniques, working with color. I hated color. Like since mm -hmm. uh, I first picked up a pen and started drawing as a kid, and until then I hated color. I didn't want to add color. I did everything in black and white with a black pen or a pencil. Those were awesome as well for the listeners. Just think. <laughs> and I, I hated color. I feared color. And I feared all of those boring things that you have to pay attention to uh, when you start your painting or drawing, whatever. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I can say that, that I totally you know, left that headspace of not wanting those things. So that was... Uh, really important thing and uh, also mastering not, not mastering trying out different techniques mm -hmm. uh, you know brushes with pastels wooden pencil colors all of those stuff uh, so not only pencil or charcoal that was really important to to kind of uh, get the sense of, of the, the difference between those techniques and different results they can produce. Also, different types of color, like for example, acrylics and mm -hmm. oil, it, it is like two different worlds. Very different, yeah. No, and uh, very different to work with. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, Cool. Yeah, I wanted to actually dig into something else. Well, you never seem to be happy with what you produce. And where, at which point do you consider something good enough to be shown? When it is good enough for me. <laughs> and <laughs> that may not come around as soon as you think. Uh, so, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm a sick Perfectionist. <laughs> when it comes to that, um, I, I'm uh, I'm rarely, even at the end, rarely happy with I have what with what I have produced. Um, but you know, there's there's this thing like when you start a project and you have something in mind for that project, then um, uh, you start on it and pursue that goal. Yeah. That takes time. And while it takes time, you change. You are uh, not the same. And you start getting different ideas. And different things pop into your mind. And that basically happens to most, if not all, of my paintings I've done in... Um, the traditional technique. So uh, that change of mind in the spur of a moment costs you a lot. Like you have to change a half of the painting, like repaint it. Which you've done. I've yeah, witnessed that. <laughs> done many times, uh, you know, until you succeed in making what you want to make not what you wanted to make from the get-go but what <laughs> new ideas you may have gotten in uh the time in between so that, that that's a thing that uh i'm not sure how often does it happen to other people but it sure does happen to me a lot and that uh takes a huge toll mm -hmm. on the time that's needed to, to yeah to finish something and also when you place on top of that my perfectionism you know you do some part you know, like tiny little part of the image 
that you know what you want to do. It's not something that, it's not a new idea. Sure, what we're doing here, but you do it, you're not happy with it. You redo it. You're not happy with it again. Yeah. You do it again, you know? You just want to kind of nail that thing that you have in your mind, and uh, it's not you know, the same, like imagining it and just doing it to be sad that, yeah, it's there, it's done. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I kind of understand that, but I'm not nearly as a perfectionist as you're. That's, mm. that's certain. Yeah, okay. Easy for you. Ah, well, you know, I'm, I'm, it's not that I'm happy with my work when I look at it with the time distance of, let's say, a couple of months. But at some point, I grow so tired of it, I don't want to look at it anymore. So the easier option yeah, is to just yeah, tell it to pop off. I also grow tired from it. I, I want to grab the painting and smash it against <laughs> my knee, you know, and throw it out the window. But, you know, I'm so hard-headed and I would rather die, <laughs> you know, <laughs> surrendering to it and just calling it done and having it watch over me every yeah. day if it's hung on the window there and laughing at me with all those ah, mistakes yeah. that I could have repaired, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I totally understand that. So, just to get into the final stretch of this whole podcast thing, you're, can you say that you're currently working your dream job? Yes, I am. What's your dream job? What is your current job title? What's your day-to-day -day work? The company you're working at? Because that's a larger story and I would like you to hear you tell it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my dream job uh, is to work on games. That's really like uh, the outline of it. That's my dream job. That's the thing I've uh, fantasized about working on a uh, really long time before it, it, it seemed like a, a plausible possibility. Uh, and yeah, uh, I did that, I managed that, uh, I was happy as hell, uh, but like with the current topic that you are asking me, I um, managed to get into Frictional Games and uh, that company, some people might be familiar with it, some might not be, it wouldn't matter, but for me, it, it was the world for me. I mean, that was like uh, the company for me that I was uh, um, mostly not, not just like mostly interested in because like that, that would uh, bring about the question that i might be a part of it but i uh that was like the the company that i was the biggest fan of mm -hmm. you know uh, like imagining to work for those guys was like <laughs> kind of a daydream not even an option um but i was like uh the biggest fan for them you know like many people have you know other like blizzard are really big among people you know like i want to be part of blizzard and also there's valve software and uh, other big companies out there but yeah those are great but for me it was frictional man <laughs> like uh all their games you know their stuff their entire catalog was always on the pre-order for me i was like I, I found out about them in 2005 when i found out about uh a game called penumbra mm -hmm. on uh on GameSpot. i found out about that game and uh, I downloaded it and I found out that it was basically a tech demo. It wasn't a full game. It was like a really, really short game. Like what, what you would expect out of a, a demo. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was basically having it on USB and uh, running uh, around at uh, friends' places with that USB stick with me and making them install it and <laughs> uh, try out the physics interaction 
uh, with the environment and you know delve into the horrific experience that it offered. Yeah, man, that was truly terrifying for me. <laughs> uh, and like since then, I was always eagerly awaiting for the new releases, which every time was under a really fat secretive rug. <laughs> <laughs> and and always you know like having them on my pre-order list and and yeah uh so uh as i am i was uh you know like uh an uh, ambassador for their games you know among people that i meet then uh and they weren't even paying you back then huh? <laughs> no. <laughs> no 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 I, i was i was just wanting to share the experience And um, with, uh, you know, like-minded people, I mean, with people that were interested with in that particular genre, like uh, uh, horror games or, you know, like moody, atmospheric, uh, serious games, mm -hmm. I would call them, you know, um, <clears throat> I would be offering their account, you know, and uh, I was at the time at, at Knock Knock Games and... Um, Uh, there was a friend that I, I nagged to to play Soma, and he played it, and uh, he beat the game one day, and he came like uh, to work, and uh, we talked about the game and the ending and you know all the stuff. And while we were talking about that, I <clears throat> it just came to my mind to check the web page again, you know, to to see what new is cooking. Hopefully. Yeah. And yeah, there were like uh listed one or two secret projects, something like that. Like right? that, that that was their tradition. It, it was always like <laughs> secret project one, secret project two, something like that. <clears throat> and uh there was there it was at the front page an ad, a job ad for uh for a three D environment artist. Mm -hmm. And uh you know I, I went over it, you know, and, you know, went over the, the expectances and the requirements for the position. And I just saw, like, well, yeah, I, you know, I... I could do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's right up my alley, you know, and like, I, I have all those things now, and, uh, <clears throat> but still, you know, Still, it felt dreamy, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't apply at first, you know, I, I was just like, ah, I saw something, some bit describing like, um, European residents, something like that, ah. you know, I, I was instantly like, nah, man, I could like never score this, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and that was it pretty much, and, you know, like I went home, I thought about it for a couple of days, And it just like sparked in my mind. Hell, man, I will apply. Oh, you know, yeah. Like, I will apply. Do it. <laughs> Let me be, you know, like honorably uh, disproved upon. <laughs> yes. Let me be dis uh, honorably rejected. Yeah, yeah. It's still I a understand. thing, you know. <laughs> they rejected me. <laughs> Not some company that I don't like, you know. <laughs> Uh, it would still be, uh, you know, you got some communication with them. <laughs> It's still a thing. Uh, you got a mail from them. You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it counts for something. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, so so I thought about it and uh, I uh, kind of got into that. Mindset, I pulled uh, away a lot of stuff from my career at that point to form a portfolio to apply mm -hmm. with, and I applied. I got a message back, um, I got a test, um, and uh, I guess I did good on that, and uh, there was a lot of You know, emails back and forth, you know, uh, a lot of uh, stuff happening through that uh, application process. You know, it kind of took some time and along that time, you know, my stress was 
rising more and more, you know, like... I imagine. <laughs> uh, if they say yes, you know, I, 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 will, I will have to, you know, uh, quit my current job right now, which, you know, I love and I feel like I'm with my family here and all of that. And, uh, you know, I never willingly quit a job that I love uh, until that point. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, like most of the people say or think like, yeah, why, what do you care, man? Like, it, it's better. If it's better, it's an easy transition. No, it's not really an easy transition. I mean, if you look at it in a logical sense, yes, it is. But it's not never an it's easy. It's not always logical, yeah. Transition, yeah. Like, uh, living behind, like, uh, things that you love and people that you love. But, yes, like, being that, being frictional games, it was more than decisive for that. And um, I got a yes, and I quit my job in uh, Knock Knock and started right away. Uh, on I uh, started working as a 3D environment artist on Amnesia River. Uh, I worked as a level artist as well as a prop artist, basically making like the, the hero props, uh, interactable and non-interactable props, big props that uh, build up some key components of the game, some key locations and uh, stages, rooms, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and also a big chunk of that work was working in the engine, which is there proprietary engine it's we are not using no oh, yeah you have your own thing. unity or unreal we have our own engine called hpl mm -hmm. <laughs> or standing for howard phillips lovecraft oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> an interesting name <laughs> yeah, it's really, yeah. um so uh yeah I, I was working a lot in the levels in level work level art that included level lighting uh, set dressing and you know, all of the stuff that didn't impact gameplay all that much, you know, but they still did. Uh, yeah, that, that lasted for some time. I'm not sure honestly how long, maybe for a year and a half mm -hmm. or two years, something like that, until Amnesia. We were released. Uh, I was a contractor all of that time, basically uh, waiting, you know, for the next word if my contract is going to be prolonged or not, you know, and that was kind of stressful. No, you were a contractor actually, you weren't yes. really into the okay. Yes, for a couple of years, yes. yes. I was a contractor, a full-time contractor, working from home mm -hmm. uh, all the time. Yeah, you know, like full-time working hours uh, through the work week. Um, and yeah, after the release of Amnesia, I I got into the uh, porting, uh, which was an amazing opportunity. Basically. Which is an upgrade of a dream job, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever that is. <laughs> something like um, throwing an anchor in your dream job. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, I am still there. We're still uh, working on games. Now I cannot say. Yeah, super secret <laughs> and stuff. I yeah, won't even ask you. part of that <laughs> secret of thing now. Yeah, but yeah, we, we have another uh, game that people know about. It's just around the corner, Amnesia Bunker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that thing's going to be crazy. I really loved it. Yeah, I played it a couple of times and I, I honestly can't wait to play it again. I was playing it in like um, unfinished phases, you know? And every next play, there's more stuff in it, yeah. more stuff that's, that's finished, and uh, I'm hoping to play the full thing. 
once again. So knowing how much of a perfectionist you are, that probably really is a good game. So I'll take your word for it for sure. So before we wrap this up, because um, one of the interesting things about you is that you really had a non-traditional career path, how you got into game development in the first place. So for anybody looking to get into the game development, what's your advice to them? Imagine a complete newbie that has a very different career path or hasn't even get, gotten started with a career path. What would you say to them? What's your advice for them to get started? I think we, we touched upon that topic a mm -hmm. uh, while ago. Uh, yeah, so if you're asking me about people who uh, like myself, don't have professional education, mm -hmm. if you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would say um, try to, that, that, that's a really difficult bit. Um, I, if you're not the first person asking me that, many people have asked me before, that's a really difficult thing that. Uh, you are asking someone where to start with, and oftentimes it includes many or few, few different departments in a company, you know? And first of all, try to narrow down your uh, choice. Try to narrow it down as much as you can. So if you like want to be, a game designer, I mean, if it's one of your things on mm -hmm. the roster, but it kind of hits the right spot and go with that. If, if it's, you know, like a 3D artist, concept artist, go with that, you know. And I believe it's it's a really difficult choice. I and mean, that, that first one may be the most difficult. And... Um, the next choice would be, I presume, like when someone makes his choice and uh, wants to pursue that path, like what should they do next with it? Like what if it's like, let's talk 3D art. If it's 3D art, like should I do animation? Should I do gaming? Mm -hmm. Oh, should I do sculpting? Should I do 3D, like generalist work, environment work, material artist? There's that as well. Like there's many other and uh, some departments in it. But it really depends on the companies that you might be working with. If it's a huge company, then you, you can be, you know, that one end of the branch. If it's a smaller company, yeah. you have to be a few branches yeah. of them. Either as specialized or sort of a generalist in a sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. or kind of try to dominate a few of those mm -hmm. branches, you know, uh, if it's a smaller company. But yeah, I mean, uh, the advice is for starting and not for, you know, if it's companies in question, then it's, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> starting yeah and that's already fine um but like for starting um and for let's say doing art 2d art or 3d art like what kind of an art should i do mm -hmm. should it be realistic should it be stylized like that's let's say um, more famous categories art falls in games and uh, I would say do what you want to do do what you yourself would enjoy looking at do that that makes you happy when you see it when you play your favorite game do right. that don't do the stuff that other people want to do do your stuff because then you will you will kind of uh, use the most of your potential in there, and maybe not from the get go, but uh, when you screw it up, 
you <laughs> and you probably will <laughs> yeah uh, you will have a better chance of not giving up right on right. that you I know see. because if you do poor or less than you expected out of yourself on something that you don't enjoy all that much to mm -hmm. begin with there is not much of an uh, initiative to proceed making it better yeah, and yeah. a little bit better before that so yeah, my advice for that would be do the things that you love because you are not the only one that loves those things there are a lot more people maybe you know not half of the world but a lot more people than you might expect that love exactly the same stuff that you love your and, thing yeah uh yeah so you know like uh those stream those those things attract each other you know they, they make connections it's un it's undeniable uh so i would say that like be be you in in that part like do what you yourself would enjoy looking at be authentic pretty much right yeah yeah and uh that's good advice of course you won't end up doing those things like absolutely maybe not from the beginning mm -hmm. uh for me it was kind of up and down and up you know uh maybe i started working on things that i love because we were making our own game i was you know kind of my own master then yeah and um uh but then a uh, time will come that you will have to do some totally different stuff that you don't like that you don't enjoy looking at you know uh but you you don't have to look at that as as a blockade in your um in your path rather uh look at it as a thing that you can pull away a lot more techniques from that you will implement into your own stuff mm -hmm. and if you work something that you don't enjoy working on but already work in that field uh, you would most probably maybe work on your own project at home you know on your own free time and uh, use all those skills acquired from making boring games and boring stuff <laughs> chores <laughs> yeah uh, you will acquire those skills and implement them into your things that you like and uh, a moment will come when people i mean other people like company people uh, notice your stuff and they will notice your quality and your interest you know it, it's more of a not really caring about how much of a good artist you are in a technical kind mm -hmm. of way but more like if you are or aren't on the same spiritual mindset level with the people mm -hmm. that you might end up working whether you click with them or not absolutely yes that thing will decide if you do the stuff that you like and you want to do and enjoy the most that will increase your chances you know cool cool that's very interesting and detailed advice and thank you for that that was really great advice so with that we're at the end of our time well we're very much past an hour it was very interesting and i enjoyed it thank you very much for that Thank you to our listeners, thank you for being on our podcast and talk to you again soon.